regardless of the verdict of juries, no player who throws a ball game, no player who undertakes or promises to throw a game, no player who sits in conference with a bunch of crooked players and gamblers where the ways and means of throwing a ball game are discussed and does not promptly tell his club about it will ever play professional baseball again. From high atop the Robinson Gearing Studio Complex and straight out of God's country, Pauly's Island, South Carolina, the Let's Talk Baseball Podcast Network proudly presents Backwards K Pod. And now, here's the host of the show, Jake Robinson. Good moment, baseball universe. What is up? What's cracking? Once again, back is the incredible. The pod animal, Jake the Snake Robinson from the Let's Talk Baseball Podcast Network. I'm coming out of Paulie's Island, South Kakalaki, half man, half podcast machine. Back in the Captain Kirk chair, shields down, both sides up. Prepare to engage on this week's digital audio program that I call Backwards K Pod, where we collect ball players and their stories. Want to welcome everyone in this week from my devoted, loyal OG Seamhead Army to anyone who may have just surfed into this barrel for the first time here. Thank you for dropping by and checking us out. Backwards K Pod is available on all platforms wherever you listen to your pods, whether it's uh, Google Play, iHeart, Stitcher, or Apple. I'm tangled all up in this web, bro. Or you can always find me or any of my shows at my website. DiamondSnakeJake.Podbean.com uh, I do take donations of Backwards k Pod. If you're on Apple or Spotify or any of these platforms that offer you a chance to rate and review my performance, please do so as you see fit. I ain't scared. I'm always willing to take five-star donations and well-written reviews touting my superlatives. These donations cost you nothing and they keep me and the show viable. As far as donating me money through Patreon and crowdsourcing, uh, you know, I, I'm going to take a hard pass on that. I love my audience, and I ain't never going to charge them a penny for the content here at Backwards K Pod. Now, I do have some things planned for next season as far as, you know, merch and, and other revenue streams are concerned. But I will never, never charge you for the content here. And and here's the thing. I love baseball. It's been my everything through my ups and downs of my life. I owe this game. My vision, my goal, it's to leave my voice behind for baseball fans and future generations of ballers and fans alike. I don't take myself seriously, but I do take the work that goes into this show very seriously. I put my heart and soul into the work. I don't only do it for the greatest CMED audience a guy could ever ask for, but I also do it for, you know, this future generation. So, look, by all means, hook me up with stars and reviews. Keep your nickels and your dimes, good brothers and sisters. I'm coming through every Tuesday with that free baseball smoke. You don't want that smoke. And I'm going to keep it consistent like Michael Jack Schmidt, baby. And look, I'm going to get right after it this week as I got more ground to cover than Willie Mays playing outfield at the Polar Grounds. You feel me? This week, I plan on dissecting the 1919 World Series fix. And this show has really p- played tricks with me eternally this week as I have wrestled with the how. How do I tell this story? 
The who? Who am I telling this story to? I mean, honestly, many White Sox fans are quite honestly over it. Not that I entirely blame them. It's not a pod that I could just drop in a White Sox group and sit back and collect my accolades. Which leads me to the most important question as to, well, you know, why am I doing this show? Which... Honestly, that's the easiest question of the three. I I do this show because it is without question the biggest scandal in sports history. And it should never, never be forgotten. I can't possibly have a collection of ballplayers and their stories without the story in the collection. And I think many of us have this eight-minute perspective that we are used to when telling this story and listening to the story. And in some ways, it's kind of been a detriment to the truth. And, and I don't mean that as a sign of disrespect to the author, Elliot Asinoff, who surely has much more info and credibility when it comes to the 1919 World Sox, uh, White Sox than I do. But most of you have seen the movie rather than read, read the book, which doesn't make anyone better than anyone else. But... Let's just say that Hollywood, well, they always have creative license to to kind of move these stories along, correct? So, let's get this runaway freight train loaded up with an all aboard. I see the catcher is coming down. And as this train rolls on to our 1919 South Chicago destination, I feel as though I have to almost... I don't know, reverse engineer your thinking about everything that you know about the 1919 fix. You guys might hear me say on here that the truth is often layered in legend, right? Have truths and sometimes outright lies. It doesn't mean there was never any truth there, but many times, especially with a story that's over a hundred years old, the facts get lathered in legend. But at the heart, the crux, there is truth. And my job is to sift through the bullshit to get to the honesty, to get to that kernel of truth. So, in order to get this story, I'm going to have to reverse engineer some of your thinking here and obliterate all the lies you've been taught. After that, I expect to have a clean canvas to work with, and then we will rebuild the story from there. Okay? So, first and foremost, we were always taught that Charles A. Comiskey, the owner of the South Chicago Baseball Club White Sox, was a cheapskate, right? Right? Uh, who paid his players peanuts, thus serving as an impetus for the players to betray his trust with this fix. Correct? Well, that's false. Put it this way. No person certainly has the ability to get into the head of a ball player from 100 years ago. But the players themselves rarely claimed, as Asimov does in his book, that it was because of Comiskey's low salaries, or poor treatment. In fact, newly available organizational contract cards have surfaced at the National Baseball Hall of Fame showing that the 1919 White Sox opening day payroll of $88,461 was more than eleven grand higher than that of the NL champion Reds. And several of the Sox players were among the highest paid players at their positions in the game. They had the third highest payroll in the American League behind only the Yankees and the Red Sox. That kind of sounds familiar, right? There were only $5,015 separating their payroll from the Yankees, and they spent almost $50,000 more than the worst paid AL team in 1919. The White, Sox, the White Sox had the highest paid catcher in the league and Ray Schalk as well as the highest-paid second baseman in the league and Eddie Collins, the two players that were not implicated in the fix. They also had the second-highest-paid left fielder in the league, Joe Jackson, with only Babe Ruth making more than him at his position. Third baseman Buck Weaver was second-highest-paid third baseman in the league, behind Frank Home Run Baker on the A's. And only one pitcher, Walter Johnson, made more money than Seacott. 
with performance bonuses, promotes hits, runs, wins, were added in. The White Sox were the best team. They were the best paid team in the American League. At one point, sometime after the scandal broke, Comiskey sent checks for $1,500 apiece to all the White Sox players who did not participate in the scheme. That sum represented the difference between the winning and losing share of the 1919 World Series. It's imperative that I mention to you that $1,500 in 1919, it has the purchasing power of around $26,000 in the 2022 economy. If the White Sox players were pissed at the oppressive reserve clause, which would totally be understandable, well, so did players from the other 15 major league teams. To say that the fix was because, you know, disgruntled players are trying to get back at a minor league owner, it's just not good enough to justify bringing down an institution and a civic trust. The metrics say that Comiskey was not a notorious cheapskate. He was no worse than any other owner of his day. And the numbers say, as far as monetarily, he was much more generous than others. So, I feel an imperative to knock that out of the ballpark first when we start this story. Another thing connected to Kami's proof of ways is a scene in 8 Men Out where Seacott is asking about a bonus that he feels he deserves for 30 wins that year, even though he won 29. And the famous line Kamiski says is 29 is not 30, right? And this is supposed to serve off as this jump point, jump off point for Seacott, who is angered by this decision and he decides to get in bed with the gamblers. Okay. Fact from fiction. In the book, this happens in 1917, not 1919. There is no basis of truth that says this was the catalyst moment. Players such as Lefty, Lefty Williams did get their bonus checks in 1919. No problem. The truth is, Seacott and first baseman Chick Gandel, they were already conspiring with gamblers to fix the World Series weeks before... Kami would have had a chance to renege on Seacock's bonus. By the way, the hitman character, Harry F. in the movie, who allegedly threatens Lefty Williams and his wife if he doesn't throw Game 8 early, well, that guy never existed. The writer, Elliot Asinoff, has admitted so repeatedly, claimed that he made up the character at his public publisher's behest, and there is little evidence to substantiate that Claude Williams or his wife were ever threatened, other than, you know, anecdotally from a neighbor boy who four decades later claimed Williams' wife told him her husband's life was threatened that day. And it's impossible to comprehend the Black Sox scandal without knowing how deep the American game was intertwined with gambling and corruption. The 1919 World Series was not the beginning. It was but the cherry on top. Baseball powers, like they always do, when they see something not right in the game, they buried their heads in the sand As first baseman Hal Chase was caught right-handed, bribing teammates and opponents alike in 1918. Future Hall of Famers uh, Ty Cobb and Tris Speaker, they were accused of fixing a game just one week before the 1919 World Series. A major fixed scandal erupted in the Pacific Coast League in 1919, so... The groundwork for a crooked 1919 World Series, it had been laid and long prepared. The scandal was not an aberration as most of us believe today. It was a crime committed against the game by villainous players. A culmination of corruption and attempted corruption that reached back to before the turn of the century. And from my research... It looks like quite a few people had guilty knowledge about the fix, including owner Charles Kaminsky, who admitted in a 1930 interview that he had heard reports about a fix before any game had been played, which leads me to ask myself, well, if Kaminsky knew, why wasn't he banned like the Chicago 8? I mean, if you're banning Buck Weaver because he knew but did nothing, then shouldn't the same logic apply to Kami. But look, I digress. I'll come back to that. Let me let me get the groundwork laid here. Stop, you know, 
I'm working towards it. So, Comiskey sent manager Kid Gleason to interview gamblers after the series was over. He also hired detectives to follow the Chicago A during the offseason. Comiskey and other baseball officials had a clear picture of what had happened in the 1919 World Series, but they went with the 1920 season without publicizing what they had learned. Only the work of diligent investigations by writers Hugh Fullerton and James Cruzenberry and a small Chicago-based gambling and trade publication called Collier's Eye. These three were the ones responsible for breaking things open for the public by publicly naming the players involved and exposing the corruption, greasing the wheels for a full legal inquiry. And the last myth I'd like to eliminate is this thought that the trial, which resulted in the acquittal of all the players, is depicted in the movie as, you know, this example of the Chicago-style corruption of those days, shady courtroom shenanigans, the theft of key files, including players' admissions of guilt from the Cook County State, uh, Cook County State Attorney's Office, and it kind of, you know, makes the audience wonder if maybe the White Sox lawyers had joined forces with the mob to help the players out of this. Or, or maybe the trial outcome was rigged in their favor all along. But the truth is that the theft was really a minor incident that played literally no role in the jury's decision whatsoever. So, with that out of the way, let's go back to the beginning. Over the decades, Major League Baseball has produced a host of memorable teams. Many of those I've covered here at BKP, and there are many, many more to go. The 1919 World Series team was the very first of the infamous teams of Major League Baseball. Even more than 100 years later, the details are murky and subject to debate. But the one central, indisputable fact remains... Talented members of the 1919 Chicago White Sox conspired with professional gamblers to fix the outcome of the 1919 World Series. Another certainty has exposed itself now 103 years later. The permanent banishment imposed in the matter of the players implicated, while perhaps an excessive sanction in certain cases, it did achieve an overarching objective. Game fixing virtually disappeared from the major league landscapes after that penalty was imposed on the White Sox. The final edict by baseball's commissioner, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, has not quelled the fascination and the controversy that surrounds the 1919 series. Quite the contrary, actually. No essay, long narrative, or a podcast show can ever hope to capture the entirety of that moment. Therefore, this week's Backwards K-Pod is is no more than one snake's rendition of the scandal. Nothing more and nothing less. Now, the plot to transform the 1919 World Series into a gambler's insider's windfall, it did not occur in a vacuum. The long-standing and often toxic relationship between baseball and gambling goes all the way back to sports infancy in 1865. Postseason play was not immune to such corruption either. The very first modern day World Series of 1903 was jeopardized by gambler attempts to bribe Boston Americans catcher Lou Krieger into throwing games. In fact, never substantiated rumors about the integrity of play dogged a number of the ensuing fall classics. The ar- architects of the Black Sox scandal have never been fully identified. Most subscribe to the notion that the plot was originally concocted by White Sox first baseman Chick Gandel and Boston bookie Joseph Sports Sullivan. Surviving grand jury testimony portrays Gandel and pitcher Eddie Seacott in cahoots as the real fix investigators. In any event, The Fix plot soon embraced many other actors, both in uniform and out. And I need you to hang in there with me as I take you through the convoluted story as I know it. Because 
Folks, there is no one lone plot to rig the World Series. There were at least two or maybe even more plots to defraud the fans. Each plot with their own peculiar cast of characters and rogue galleries of villains. And the White Sox clubhouse, it was an, an, an unhealthy environment with the team fractured by factions and cliques. One clique was headed by second baseman Eddie Collins, an Ivy League educated lad who sell cops confidence and bordered on brazen arrogance. He was in league with future Hall of Fame catcher Ray Schalk, spitballer Red Faber, and outfielder Shane O'Collins and Nemo Leibold. And another click was a more hard knocks crew that absolutely loathed Collins and Schalk and their socially superior skills. They were headed by Gandalf. And the much more amiable Seacott. This group would have included Buck Weaver, Swede Brisberg, Happy Fels, and Freddie McMullen. Still, another crew would have been like the Southern Boys, headed by Claude Letty Williams and Joe Jackson. Now, according to the grand jury testimony of Eddie Seacott, his faction first began to discuss throwing the series during a training trip late in the season before the Sox had even clinched the AL pennant. It was then that the catcher or the pitcher began feeling out Bill Burns, a former pitcher turned gambler, about financing a series fix. And according to Seacott, those the White Sox were envious well the players were envious of the ten grand that was paid to certain members of the cross town rival Cubs for allegedly dumping the nineteen eighteen World Series against the Boston Red Sox. Now, the lore of a similar score with a low prospect of getting caught or punished oh, was too great for the greedy ballplayers to dismiss. By mid-September, the Gandal Seacock crew were committed to a series fix during a meeting at the Ansonia Hotel in New York City. The likelihood of the scheme's success was bolstered by the recruiting of superhero left fielder Joe Jackson and the club's number two starter, Claude Lefty Williams. In the follow-up conversation with Bill Burns, it was agreed that the Sox would lose the 1919 World Series to the NL champion Cincinnati Reds in exchange for $100,000. Now, Financing a payoff of that magnitude, $100,000 in 1919, is worth about $1.9 million in today's economy. Well, it was kind of beyond Burns' means. Efforts to secure backing from gambling elements and filthy, they came up empty. So Burns and his sidekick, Billy Mahark, they approached the big bankroll. New York City's underground financer of the time, Arnold Rothstein. And the truth is... You know, Arnold's a pimp. He's got his ear to the ground on all things criminal involving money. And he probably knew all about the scheme before Maharg and Burns approach him. Well, Rothstein flatly turns down the proposal to finance the series. And this is where the plot to fix the 1919 World Series begins to thicken. The prospect of financing the fix was set again in motion by the former Major League Baseball player, Hal Chase, whom I mentioned earlier. And it's not clear how Chase knew the scheme, but criminals are criminals, and they hang in circles and leagues. And regardless how he found out, he knew, sensing a chance at some easy cash, Chase put Burns in touch with one of the sport's shadiest characters of the time, former world featherweight boxing champ, a Battelle, a part-time Rothstein bodyguard and a full-time hustler, always looking for the angles and a score. Attell met with Burns and informed him that Rothstein had reconsidered the fixed proposition and was now willing to finance it. Whereupon, Burns hastily returned to the Queen City to rendezvous with the players on the eve of Game 1. In the meantime... The campaign to fix the series had opened the door to a second front. Shortly before the players left for Cincinnati, Gandalf Seacott Weaver and others, they met privately at the Warner Hotel in Chicago. And a mistrustful Seacott, he made the decision, unlike the others, to demand that $10,000 be paid to him in full before the team arrives in Cincinnati. 
He then left the gathering to socialize elsewhere, and the others remained to hear the two men identified as Sullivan and Brown from New York. A confused Letty Williams later testified that he was unsure if these men were the gamblers or they were financing the fix or they were like representatives. He was kind of confused exactly who these two cats were. The first Warner Hotel fixer had always been identified as Gandalf Sports uh, Pal Sports Sullivan, but the true identity of Brown would remain a mystery for the fix investigators. Decades later, Abe Attell asserted that Brown was actually Nat Evans, a junior associate of Arnold Rothstein. Whoever Brown was, $10,000 in cash had been placed under the bed pillow in Seacott's hotel room before the night was over. And with that action, the wheels of history are set in motion as the World Series fix is on in earnest and nothing, nothing can stop it now. It's going to happen. The Warner Hotel was unknown to Burns, who was... uh, that meeting was unknown to Burns, who was trying to finalize his own r- racket with the players. He and Attell, they met with all the corrupted players except Joe Jackson at the Centon Hotel in Cincinnati sometime prior to the series opener. After considerable, considerable wrangling, it was agreed upon that the players would receive $20,000 installments after every White Sox lost in the best of nine series. That's about... $340,000 in the 2022 economy for every loss. Later that evening, Burns ran into Chicago sports writer Hugh Fullerton, who I mentioned earlier. And like most baseball experts of their day, Fullerton was predicting uh, the White Sox trouncing the Reds in the series. But something in Burns' tones indicated to Fuller House that the Reds were a sure thing. Remember, Burns had a stigma as a former player turned gambler, and just the way Burns suggested this info, it put uh, Fullerton on pause. Almost simultaneously, the betting odds began to shift dramatically. The once huge underdog Cincinnati Reds, with a surge of big money bets, were now slight favorites to win the World Series. And to many baseball insiders, something foul was afoot. Now, to those unaware of the betting line, the Game 1 matchup it typified the inequity and the chasm of talent level between the two teams. On the mound for the Chicago was uh, 29 game winner Eddie Seacott, a veteran hurler from the 1917 championship team, and his opponent was Dutch Ruther, who prior to his 19 wins in 1919, he had won a grand total of three games. Aside from the control master, Seacott plunking Reds leadoff hitter Maury Rath with his second pitch which was a message to the gamblers that the fix was on. The game proceeded rather unremarkably in the early going. In the fourth, Seacott took it upon himself to make the gamblers happy, and he inexplicably fell apart. By the time a stunned Kid Gleason relieved him, the Reds had a comfortable 6-1 lead, and the final score would be Reds 9, White Sox 1. Following the delivery of the promised loss, the players were stiffed by fixed paymaster A. Boutel, who reneged on his $20,000 payment. But the White Sox, again, they honored their agreement. Game two, they dropped it. Lefty Williams in a sudden bout of control issues in the fourth. It doomed Chicago as the Reds with a 4-2 victory. Now had a two games to zero advantage. And with the corrupted players now owed forty grand. Burns was hard-pressed to even get a fraction of that from Mattel, who claimed that the money was all out on bets. And what are they going to do? Call a cop? Here's ten grand, and that's it. When Burns and the ten grand showed up, uh, the players were getting heated. They began to accuse Burns of a double crossing, and you know they're they're not they're not happy to see him only show up with ten thousand dollars. Still, Burns and Maharg accept Gandalf's assurances that the Sox would lose Game Three. 
Uh, but they would be totally wiped out, losing their entire wagering stake when the White Sox, behind the pitching of Dickie Kerr, who was not in on the picks, he shut out the Reds 3 to nothing in Game 3. When the series uh, fix continued after Game uh, whether the series fix continued after Game 2 was a matter of debate, Joe Jackson would later tell the press that Chicago had tried to throw Game 3 only to be thwarted by uh, Dickie Kerr's performance. Uh, There were those who made the argument that the Sox were playing on the square by Game 3. And they cite uh, fixed ring leader Chick Gandles game-breaking two RBI single in that game. So, with the series now standing at 2-1, Seacott took them out in the most controversial game of the season. Game four saw Seacott match up with Brent's fireball pitcher Jimmy Ring. Seacott exhibited pitching artistry that was expected from him in game one, but his fielding was atrocious. With the game turning on two of his defensive misplays in the fifth, and those miscues provided the margin and a two to nothing Reds win. Seacott later maintained that he had tried his best to win Game 4, but he received little help from his offense. The White Sox, both clean and dirty, were mired in an astonishing 26 consecutive scoreless inning slump. Chicago bats were again silent in Game 5, managing only three hits of the 5-0 loss that had now pushed the White Sox to the brink of elimination. Reds pitcher Jimmy Rand gave up only three hits that day. One to shoeless Joe Jackson, one to Happy Happy Felch, and one to Chick Gandle. Meanwhile, there is doubt creeping into the gambler's circle. With the unscripted Sox winning Game 3, Burns repeatedly, at the behest of Mattel, approaches Gandle about resuming the fix, and Gandle tells him politely to go fuck himself. Now, whether that brought the curtain down on the fix is still a matter of debate, Remember, Burns and Attell are not the only bookies that the players are beholden to. The corrupted players have made it clear that more than ten thousand post uh, uh, more than ten thousand dollars post game two playoff uh, was dispersed among the players. But who made these play payoffs? When? Where? How were they made? How much? Fix money in total was paid out by the gamblers. How much of that money did Chick skim off the top? And according to multiple players, the money was not distributed evenly at all. Chick kept about thirty-five thousand dollars. Sweet Risburg took fifteen grand. Seacott made ten grand all up front. Outfielders Chulis Joe and Happy Fels, pitcher Lefty Williams, utility man, uh, utility man Fred McMullen, they pulled down $5,000 apiece. Buck Weaver took nothing. And having cheated the fans, the players proceeded to cheat each other. So, with Chicago teetering on the brink of elimination in naval terms, their ship is in a sharp starboard list. She's taken on water. She's starting to roll under the pressure of digging such a deep hole in the first five games. Only winning one. And the gamblers have made it clear. They are double-crossing the players. The players are double-crossing their own teammates. And the team has their backs against the wall should they ever decide to give the gamblers a finger and play the rest of the series on the level. All the while, the Sox fans are wound tighter than an airport sandwich at this point, wondering just what the hell is going on with their powerhouse baseball team. The outlook was even bleaker in Game 6. With Cincinnati up four games to one already, they took an early 4 nothing lead behind Dutch Ruther, but finally, the dormant White Sox bats finally came to life in the middle of the lineup, and Weaver, Shoeless, and Happy Felsch, they, roll, they rallied the Chicago offense to a 5-4 to victory in 10 innings, as Game 3 starter Dickie Kerr threw another complete game victory. The ensuing Game 7 at Redland, Crosley Field, was a type of game the pundits had expected from the Sox and Eddie Seacott from the outset of the series. 
Seacott seemingly had a change of heart because he absolutely destroys the Reds on October 8, 1919 as he scattered seven hits, but he only gives up one run in a 4-1 to Sox victory. More than likely, you know, this is a message Eddie is sending to the gamblers who are late on their payments to these corrupted players. Now, only one way away from evening up the series, all eyes turn to Southpaw stalwart Lefty Williams at home. Unfortunately, the Reds jumped on Lefty in the first, so the White Sox fell behind 4 nothing in the opening frame. Cincinnati continued to bury Chicago that day before a 4 nothing rally in the eighth, uh, before a four run rally in the eighth by the Sox made the score somewhat respectable. The Reds 10 and the White Sox 5. Clinching Cincinnati's first World Series. The next day, the baseball universe had reveled in the astonishing upset by the Red Legs over the unsinkable Titanic White Sox. However, it was somewhat tempered by writer Hugh Fullerton that I mentioned earlier in a widely circulated column. Fullerton outright questions the integrity of the White Sox performance. He also made a startling revelation that at least seven White Sox players would not be wearing a Chicago uniform the next season. And it's my opinion that Buck Weaver's name was not on that list, was not on his radar as his series play was flawless, you know, in baseball terms. Fullerton's commentary initially was not well received. Many of his sports writer brethren characterized Fullerton's assertions as nothing more than sour grapes from an expert who was embarrassed by the misfire of his World Series prediction. For its part, MLB ignored Fullerton's charges as he was making the circuit on Baseball Magazine and the Sporting News. In the short run, the strategy worked. Despite his reiterations and op-ed pieces and follow-up columns, Fullerton's suspicions gained very little traction in the baseball universe among the fans. The, na- the, the notion that the 1919 series wasn't on the level was mostly forgotten in, in the news cycle. The players had done it, and just like Seacott thought, no evidence of wrongdoing and no punishment. No one even remembers last year's World Series. Well, the dudes at White Sox headquarters remembered, and that's going to be a problem for these cats. Unbeknownst to the sports uh, press or public, Comiskey had not clearly dismissed allegations made against his team. While the series was underway, Comey was given intelligent reports that his boys were going to throw the series. And late December, in the no gamblers, Harry Redman and Joe Pesh, they sat Mr. Comiskey and the White Sox brass down, and in detail, they told the owner how the picks worked, and the players that were involved were promised a hundred grand to get it done. And this now puts the onus on Charles Comiskey. What will his decision be? On one hand, he wants these deviants punished severely for costing him and the city of Chicago the World Series title. But, on the other hand, he can't bear the thought of scrapping this juggernaut team and breaking them up. And this decision, it weighed heavy on his conscience. In the end, Kami does what most people do. He pursues the avenue of self-preservation. He keeps his fucking mouth shut about what he knows. And early in the new year, at uh, 1920, Comiskey re-signs corrupted players Joe Jackson, Happy Felsch, Sweet Risberg, and Lefty Williams. All of them received hefty pay raises. Only fix co-ringleader, co-ringleader Chick Gandal faced the wrath of Comiskey. The owner offered him a deal with the same salary as the year before. When Gandal, as expected, rejected that deal... Kami took great pleasure in placing him on the club's ineligible list for the season, and it effectively ended Gandalf's career. He would never play in a Major League Baseball game again after the 1919 World Series. Now, from a financial standpoint, Comiskey's silence had paid off. 
with the defending AL champs back together, minus Gandel. The White Sox spent the 1920 season in the midst of an exciting three-way pennant battle with the Yankees and the Cleveland Indians. A pennant battle that I covered extensively in the death of Ray Chapman pot. If you haven't heard the death of Ray Chapman, you should definitely be on that for sure. You can go to any platform that has uh, my podcast show on and it's got my catalog there. Or you can visit my website, diamondsnakejake.podbean.com. Okay, so where was I? Oh, uh, yeah. Kom- Comiskey Silence, it, it's paid off. Uh, attendance at Comiskey Park is at an all-time high. The coffers are overflowing in cash. Then in late 1920, something happens that burns it all to the ground. It started out as such a small nothing burger. Just a little piece of baseball corruption news. The suspected fix of a meaningless game in late August between the Cubs and the Phillies. And like I said, a big nothing burger, a minor distraction, the latest minor annoyance that bedeviled the game that year. The spring baseball learned of proclivities of how Chase revealed during a trial of breach of contract. Then in early August, West Coast baseball baseball followers were shaken by allegations that cast serious doubt upon the legitimacy of the 1919 Pacific Coast League crown win by the Vernon Tigers. And the significance of these matters lied on the shoulders of Cubs President William Beck Sr. and the angry owner William Wrigley, who is besides himself with fury over the prospect that his L.A. Angels may have been cheated out of a PCL pennant. He orders Beck to make a public disclosure of the Cubs' Phillies fix reports and pledges club cooperation with any investigative body wishing to delve into the problem. Within days, influential sports writer Joe Volta of the New York Sun, a prominent uh, Chicago businessman, Freddie Luminous, and others were pressing for a more substantial target upon the grand jury, the 1919 World Series. Privately, Ben Johnson who would go on to be president of the American League, but at this time served as chief justice of Chicago's criminal courts, he urged a similar course upon the jurists. Like Comiskey, Johnson had conducted his own investigation into the outcome of the 1919 World Series, and there was no doubt in his mind that the series was corrupted. The judge, Charles McDonald, was amenable to expanding the probe. By the time the grand jury had conducted its first substantial Set a substantial session on an inquiry into the Cubs Phillies game. Well, that game was pretty much relegated to secondary status, and the panel's attention was squarely, squarely on the 1919 World Series. The proceedings were remarkable in that there was a total disregard of the mandated jury secrecy. The violation of the law was justified on the premise that baseball would benefit from airing out its sins and dirty laundry. Soon, newspapers nationwide were repeating the details, often verbatim, of the testimony. Within days, the transparency of the proceedings uh, announced the impending indictment of the eight White Sox players. Eddie Seacott, Chick Gandel, Shoeless Joe Jackson, Buck Weaver, Lefty Williams, Happy Felsch, Sweet Risberg, and Fred McMullen. Soon thereafter, the press began calling them the Black Sox. For the first time being, the charge against them was, you know, a generic conspiracy to commit an illegal act. The scandal spotlight was shipped to Philly, where a fixed insider was giving an interview that would blow the scandal wide open. In the September 27th, 1920 edition of the Philadelphia North American, Billy Mahark declared that Games 1, 2, and 8 of the 1919 series had been rigged. According to Mahark, the outcome of the first two games had been procured by the burns Attell Combine. The abysmal pitching by Lefty in Game 8 was the product of intimidation of Lefty Williams by monsters. As I suggested later, that is still questionable to this day. Uh, The republication 
uh, Mahar's testimony produced a stunning result as both Joe Jackson and Eddie Seacott admitted their involvement in the fix the very next day. The two men repeated their admission under oath before the grand jury. However, neither Seacott nor Shoeless Joe ever confessed to deliberately missing plays during the season. Press accounts of how Seacott admitted to lobbing meatballs to red hitters or Shoeless Joe confirming that he deliberately failed at bat or in the field, well, those reports were entirely bogus. According to the transcripts, transcripts, neither player at any moment told the grand jury any such thing. Seacott and Jackson both insisted that they had played to win at all cost against the Reds. The other players involved were identified by Eddie and Joe, but apart from laying the brunt of the blame on Gandalf's doorstep, neither man discussed much knowledge of how the fix had been instigated, or who had financed it. The following day, Claude Williams admitted to joining the fixed conspiracy and accepting the gambler's cash. But Lefty also denied that they, uh, he had done anything corrupt on the field to earn his payment. He claimed to have tried his best, even in that abysmal game eight start. Happy Fels, when interviewed, admitted his complicity in the fix, and the acceptance of Gambler's money. But his subpar season performance, particularly defensively, had not been deliberate as far as he was concerned. Phillips would add that he was prepared to make a game decisive misplay, but the opportunity never presented itself. Unlike Seacott, Shoeless and Lefty, Happy kept his mouth shut and didn't name any other conspirators, although he did say he respected Seacott's game for getting all that money up front. A far different stance was adopted by the remaining four players as Gandil, Risberg, McMullen, and Buck Weaver all state their innocence, with Weaver vociferously protesting his innocence and adamant about obtaining legal counsel and fighting every charge against his name. On October 29, 1920, more than a year after the World Series, five counts of conspiracy to obtain money by false pretenses and or via a confidence game were returned against every corrupt White Sox player as well as Buck Weaver, Bill Burns, A. Mattel, Hal Chase, and Sports Sullivan were also charged in the indictments. The stage now shifts to the criminal courts, where the murky becomes even darker. When the regime of a new state's attorney, Robert Crow, underway, he found that the Black Sox case was in a disarray. The investigation underlying the indictments was incomplete. Evidence was now missing from the prosecutor's vault, and com- including admissions of guilt by Seacott, Jackson, and Lefty. Even worse yet, it appears that Crow's predecessors in office had Premise the prosecution of the case on the cooperation from Eddie, Shulis, and Williams, each of whom had admitted Vic's complicity during the grand jury. But now they're standing firm in solidarity with their teammates and are seeking to have their grand jury testimony confessions suppressed by the court on legal grounds. And this now puts the pressure on the prosecutors to rethink and rebuild their case. Eventually, the state would rebuild their case as the prosecution was besieged on many fronts. They would be deluged by defense motions to di- dismiss charges, suppress evidence, limit testimony, etc., etc. Prosecutors were also having trouble getting their gambler defendants into court. Sports Sullivan went on the lam. Hal Chase and Abe Attell successfully fight off extradition. In the trial run-up, The prosecution receives a boost when Bill Burns is found in Mexico and agrees to turn state's evidence in return for immunity. Now, the prosecutors have finally got their crucial fix insider that this case was lacking. (laughs) Appearing on Castle on behalf of the accused was an army of some of the most brilliant Midwest legal minds. Uh, and criminal defense lawyers that money could buy. Uh, although outnumbered, the prosecution was hardly outgunned, as they would also fill chairs with some of the most experienced trial lawyers on the planet. 
About the only wild card and unproven commodity in the trial was newly assigned trial judge Hugo Friend. Judge Friend would go on to have a distinguished 46-year career on Illinois trial and appellate benches, but at the time of the Black Sox trial, he was a judicial novice, and he was presiding over his first big-time trial. And although his medal would be tested by in-house bickering and exhausting motions presented to him, Judge Friend's intelligence and sense of fair play would stand him in good stead with both sides. And the case, for the most part, was well tried, if not error free. And folks, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not a lawyer. Although from time to time I'm forced to play one on the pod. So I'm not going to get bogged down in the intricacies of the, of the case. That is so out of my pay grade. There were legal arguments made that Seacott, Jackson, and Lefton, Lefty were given an off-the-record immunity for their testimony before the grand jury, which created a, well, a salty argument, let's call it that, full of swearing. Judge Friend, after hearing both sides, determines that the players had confessed freely with no immunity promises. The prosecutors then put Bill Burns and Billy Maharg on the stand, and the gamblers leveled damaging info to the court about those involved and how it all worked. Also present was White Sox Secretary Harry Grabner, whose testimony about the soaring 1920 revenue, well, that undermined the contention that Comiskey and the White Sox had been injured by losing the 1919 World Series. Years later, Jory Foreman, William Barry would tell Judge Friend that Mr. Grabner's uh, testimony, it had more influence on the jury over that of any other witness. When the jury retired to deliberate, it took less than three hours to reach a verdict. With the parties involved in the courtroom, as well as the bystanders and press, the court was in a hush, as everyone is hanging on every word out of the court clerk's mouth. Not guilty on all charges. A smiling judge friend, he concurred. He pronounced the jury's victim a a verdict a fair one. And with that, pandemonium, pandemonium erupts as jurors begin shaking hands of the men they had just acquitted. Soon thereafter, defense lawyers, jurors, and defense followers, they gathered on the courthouse steps where their joy was captured by a photo published by the Chicago Tribune. And you can find that on your Google machine if you want to see it. Later, a post-verdict celebration brought the jurors and players together once again as they celebrated into the wee hours of the morning at a nearby Italian restaurant singing, Hail, Hail, the gang's all here. But... Not everyone was overjoyed with the verdict, especially with Shoeless, Seacott, and Lefty caught dead to rights. Many baseball owners vowed to never employ the A players, but that was rendered academic. Commissioner Kenny Salt Mountain Landis had taken note of the minor league expulsion of the Pac League players who had their indictments dismissed as well in a court of law. Landis a judge himself who had been hired as an unlimited power baseball commissioner for life in November of 1920. He was now ready to chop the heads off anyone involved in the 1919 World Series fix. Landis, uh, you heard the clip at the beginning of the show, he permanently banned all eight players from ever participating in Major League Baseball again. And with that, Shoeless Joe Jackson... Eddie Seacott, Chick Gandel, Swede Risberg, Fred McMullen, Happy Felsch, and Lefty Williams were banned for life. Buck Weaver, Buck Weaver is the most egregious banning in baseball history as far as I'm concerned. More so than Shoeless, certainly more so than Pete Rose. Buck took zero dollars and he put up solid numbers in that series. But he knew of the fix and he said nothing. And for that, Mountain Landis brands him forever as a corrupted piece of that White Sox team. I'm sorry, I just don't agree with the Weaver punishment. He should have been punished, but I think a lifetime ban is just way too much for Buck Weaver. Some of you may disagree. Drop me a line. Tell me what you think. Because that, my seam head army, is the story of the Chicago 
I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed telling it. And look, folks, the jury acquittal and the subsequent lifetime ban by Commissioner Landis, it's not really the end of the story. For many years after, there were lawsuits filed against the White Sox and Major League Baseball by the corrupted players. I implore you to get out there and do the research yourself. There are a lot of layers to the story. And a one-hour podcast can hardly do justice to this sort of tale. But I'm not here to do two or three parters of a story. I got you started with a hell of a template. Now go out there and learn more about this story. Of course, if you're going to want to read that uh, Elliot Asnoff classic, Eight Men Out, the movie is great. But, like I said, Hollywood does take creative license throughout the flick. The book is more... Uh, documentarian and factual so you know try to keep that in mind another book I highly recommend is Rothstein a book by American historian and storyteller David Petruza it's fantastic I came about this book years ago from my love of you know like old time gangsters like Lucky Luciano Al Capone Meyer Lansky and folks this dude Petruza is a phenomenal writer, he breaks it all down the inside movie parts of the 1919 fix from the big bankroll, Arnold Rothstein's perspective, and I highly, highly recommend this book so, with the Chicago 8 and the 1919 World Series in the books and it's going smaller and smaller in my rearview mirror, I now turn my attention to next week's show And I'm going to stay right here on the south side of Chicago, baby. And before I tell you why I'm staying here, I just want to reinforce my love Chicago. I built a connection with that city when I graduated from uh, Navy boot camp back in 1989. And I've doubled down on my love for that town. Every time I look at my ratings, I fall right back in love with Chicago. No major city has supported me this year the way Chicago has. The whole state of Illinois, but the city of Chicago in particular. You have made this first season of BKP very special for me. And I am forever grateful. And that's why I'm staying here with you Southies next week. We will be discussing the history of Guaranteed Raid Park, or as I call it, Comiskey 2.0. This will be the last Stadio Bile I will be doing this year, as this is the last stadium built before Oriole Park and Camden Yards uh, when you know the retro stadiums take over in 1992, and that will be the first stadium we look at in Season 2. I'm giving you the history of Fenway, Wrigley, Dodger Stadium, the Big A, Kaufman, Rogers Center. We skipped over the mausoleum in Alameda County for the A's and that shitbox in Tampa. And now we are on to Guaranteed Rape Park. Don't forget, I've also given you throwback cribs for uh, Polar Grounds, Crossley Field, Shy Park. All of these shows are in my archives And all of them are on your uh, pod platforms, wherever you listen to your pods. Or you can go to diamondsnakejake.poppy.com to check those stadium shows out as well. So, yeah, I'm staying here in the shy, and I love it. I can't wait to bring the history of GRP. But look, that's another story for another pod here at Backwards K-Pod, where we collect ballplayers... And their stories. Parents, if you see your kid sitting on the couch looking bored AF, by all means, take him or her outside and play a game of catch. Thank you all for coming out. God bless and win the day. And like my boy Shay Ellenbrand told me on the show a couple weeks ago, you go to hell, Andy Pennant. <laughs>